Um, so welcome to our class. If you've joined the recording, you've missed a couple of minutes um, because I forgot, so I apologize, but we're going to carry on. Um, and so, so in Genesis chapter 10, what's happening there is you've got these, this, this global commune, this global government, which is going to be divided and separated into different nations, into different oceans, into different seas. And the way he does that is he confuses their tongues so they can't communicate. So they can't speak words of power. So they can't call forth the reality that they want, which is the power that God has given to us. We have the power to use the words of Logos to call forth into reality our futures, which is why it's so important that we're careful how we speak. And we've covered that um, in, in previous classes. And so what we find in Daniel chapter four is God says, I rule in the kingdoms of men. And so he's going to establish it. So what, what is the boundary? What is the thing that, that it can't pass? Well, it can't pass the sand. Um, he says in Job uh, chapter 26, verse 10, that he's compassed it, compassed the land about. Verse um, 10. God compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. So in other words, what he's saying is that these boundaries will never be shifted. They'll never be, you have to stop day and night before you'll be able to stop God's containment of the proud raging seas. Now, here's a question for you. What does sand represent? So if the oceans represent the nations and the peoples and land represents that which is productive, that which is fruitful, what does the sand represent, do you think? I, 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 I would suggest the possibility that because um, the promises to Abraham were given on the basis that the, the, the descendants... Yep, go on. Yep, you're on, you're on something. It, it definitely is. It's definitely the sand people. We spoke about the sand people last week, didn't we? Um, come across to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 20. It represents, you know, just as a general thing, that which is populous, that which is many. Um, but uh, 1 Kings 4, verse 20, we have these words. Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. Um, it's also picked up in Isaiah in a negative way where it says that Israel was as the sand of the sea, but God's judgments whittled them down so that it was only a remnant that might be saved. But we have this idea, don't we? Um, they're quite cute sand people, they are. Terrifying. <laughs> I couldn't find a... I had, I had one of... I had a sand person sculpture of... Um, of the lead singer of the Rolling Stones, I thought that probably wasn't appropriate. Um, but but you remember we had we spoke about this this idea in our last class about sand people and star people. Remember the promise made to Abraham um, that he would greatly God would greatly multiply his seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore. And so the sand is the thing that separates the nations from that which is productive. Now that's a really interesting concept. It's a really interesting idea. What do you think it is about the Jews that prevent the nations from overwhelming that which is productive? If you're on mute, I can't hear you. But what did God promise Abraham? God promised a blessing, didn't he? He promised a blessing to Abraham, and there was a personal blessing, and there was a national blessing, and there was an international blessing. All families of the earth would be blessed in Abraham. And it's that promise that causes God to continually restrain these nations from overwhelming that which is productive, from overwhelming the foundation of the ecclesia. We're going to look a bit at that. Come across to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. And we read these words. Uh, verse 7 for context. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries 
of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Oh, I could read that a bit differently. He separated the oceans. He set the boundaries of the seas according to the number of the children of Israel. And so it was Israel, which is the boundary. It's the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is the boundary that prevents the nations from overwhelming the ecclesia. And is that is it, it, it's obviously true. Like Genesis chapter 10, God changed everybody's languages because they were going to overthrow the nation, the, the family of God. We find that there is a remnant left of Israel and they're taken into captivity. The good fix are taken into captivity. He uses the nations to preserve them. And then he returns them back to the land. And even in modern times, we've seen numerous wars over Israel as a nation with vastly outnumbered, much better weapons, much better funded armies. And they've never been able to root out this little nation been a, been a strip of dirt in the desert out of their inheritance. They haven't been able to do it. And so God has set the boundary for them. Now, come across to Psalm 104, because we looked at this a little bit last week. And I just want to pick up a couple of ideas here. So I've sort of been giving you the clue of what the land is, but we might just, just have another quick chat about that. So Psalm 104 and verse 9, we read here, they were set a boundary that the oceans might not pass over, that they cannot turn again to cover the earth. Okay, why is that? Well, the earth is that which is fruitful. It's the foundation of fruitfulness. Verse 14, he causes the grass to grow for the cattle, the herb for the service of man, that he might bring forth good out of the earth. And wine, it makes glad the heart of man. And oil, it makes his face shine. And bread, it strengthens his heart. And so this is the fruitfulness, this is the bountifulness of the land. And the oceans are prevented from overwhelming it. They're prevented from destroying it. And despite a desire to overwhelm and to overthrow the word of God and the, and the people of God, you just have to look at the philosophies of the world today and what's what's been going on with, oh, I don't want to go into the details, it's terrifying what's going on, but, but they are looking to remove God from the family. They're looking to destroy the family, which is which is terrifying. Now, why do I say that the earth is the foundation for productivity and the foundation for the ecclesia? Well, we're told. <laughs> Funnily enough, we're told that. So come across to John chapter one. We've been looking at John, haven't we? Remember that John chapter one is the spiritual creation story. We've compared. The, the days in Genesis to the days outlined in John chapter one. We've got these four days and then we skip a day. And then in chapter two, of John, we've got the third day being the seventh day in the marriage. That's the marriage supper. Um, but we're told in first of John chapter one, verse 14. Uh, I might have the wrong verse there. Let me check my note quickly. I'm not going to read that whole section. Verse 42, I think is the one I'm after. Yeah. Verse 41, of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew and Simon, Peter's brother. Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. Two people, not three. Um, he first finds his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is called Christ. And he brought Peter to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld Peter, he said to him, your name is Simon, son of Jonah. But from this point forward, you'll be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. In other words, he says, I'm going to change your name from heard or hearing, Simeon, to a rock, a piece of ground. Now, why does he do that? We don't, we don't find out for a little while, do we? Come across to Matthew chapter 16, which is where we get the next part of the puzzle. Matthew 16, uh, verse 16. There uh, we go. And this is a conversation about uh, verse 13. Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? And they said, some say that you are John the Baptist, others say that you're Elijah, others say that you're Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. 
And he said to them, but who do you think I am? And Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, you are Peter, you are the rock. And upon this rock will I build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell, or the oceans, will not prevail against it. That which seeks to destroy the ecclesia will not prevail against you. That's what he's saying. The grave itself, death itself, will not prevent the ecclesia from being destroyed. It will not destroy the ecclesia. It will it'll never succeed. Interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that he says, well, you're ground. You're the foundation. You're the rock. And on, on this declaration, on this declaration, the ecclesia is going to be fruitful. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that the basis that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is the basis upon or by which the ecclesia is fruitful? Well, again, we're told, come across to John chapter 15. And this is this is the section, this is this is um, during the period of the Last Supper and the prayers that. In, in the discussion that Jesus has with his disciples after Judas has left, and and he has this discussion about, and, and so this is in the context of him being the Son of God and being the Messiah, and he says to them, I am the true vine, and my father is a husbandman. Each branch in me that bears not fruit, he's taken away. Well, how is it that we are part of the vine? How is it that we are part of Christ? Well, we're part of Christ because we're baptized into his name, and we become one with him he abides on us and we abide in him but how is it that that can be possible well the only reason that that can be possible is because he's the messiah the only reason that the only way that can be possible is because he is the son of god and so we are a branch of the true vine we're a branch of the christ and what's the objective of the branches well the objective the objective of the branches is to bring forth fruit and that vine is the son of god and so we are therefore part of that foundation we're founded upon that principle that principle is our foundation it is our grounding it's our rock it's our earth it's the thing that sustains us and enables us to be able to bring forth fruit John picks up these ideas later on in his letter. Uh, John 1, verse 2. First of John 1, I should say. First of John 1, verse 2. Uh, 2, verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? So, so. If you say Jesus isn't the Christ, then you're a liar and you're denying your foundation. You're denying the rock upon which you are founded. That person is the Antichrist. He's against Christ because he denies both the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. In that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. You also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. In other words, Christ abiding in us and us abiding in Christ so that we might in fact be fruitful. So coming back then, I guess one other little quick point while we're, while we're here, just finishing off on this day three, um, you know, the parable of the sower is, is also a very powerful conversation isn't it because the parable of the sower is all about the ground you had rocky ground and you had shallow ground and you had ground that produced weeds and you had ground that produced a crop and so adam is made from the ground of the ground and when he disobeys god he's returned back to to that from which he came he's returned back to the ground and so the question then is are we the type of people that would allow the word of God to create something in us 
or are we the type of people that are going to allow other things to smother the word of God or are we going to be distracted by our own desires and pleasures to not allow the word of God impact us because God wants to create something that is fruitful as the parable says um, some bring forth 30 fold some 60 fold some 100 fold so let's come back then to day six because day six is related um, how do we know day six is related to this idea of fertility and productivity well um, God tells us that it's kind of handy uh, he says in verse 28 God blessed Adam and Eve and he said to them this is day six be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and yeah the earth is that which is to be replenished the earth is that which is to be made productive and fruitful um, and Adam and Eve are to be productive and fruitful and so day three we have the oceans and the sea being separated from the land and then in day six we've now got the creation of the land animals and in day six the summary that the culminating point of day six and when the culminating point of day five and the culminating point of day four three two and one are the creation of adam and eve the cherubim and so we have these animals are being created first and and the order here is a little bit different in chapter two and there's a good reason for that and we, we might touch on that in a bit but these different animals are created and it's interesting because animals are used throughout the word of god to represent characteristics we use animals to represent characteristics it's just not foreign to us so you know um if i said um you know that person over there is a real snake in the grass what am i I'm, he, what am i saying well he, he's not literally a snake and he's not literally in the grass what am i saying saying he's dangerous and he's cunning um, christ called here that old fox what was he saying well he was identifying a characteristic in herod which was again dangerous and cunning um, christ says be wise as serpents but harmless as doves or what he's not saying that we should adopt the thinking of the serpent and he's not saying that we should perch on church steeples right he's he's identifying characteristics in these animals and it's interesting that through through the law of moses god spends a lot of time talking about animals now, he spends a lot of time talking about animals he talks about clean animals and unclean animals right Levit uh, leviticus chapter 11 and um, you know these these animals have got clean animals and, and unclean animals and so what does that mean well it says well he says there are characteristics which are clean and there are characteristics which are unclean and when we get to genesis chapter 2 we find that in verse um 18 god said it's not good that the man should be alone let's make him a, a help mate and rather than creating a woman for him he goes and creates a whole bunch of animals and gets adam to name them it's like what's that about that's just the logical thing to do is like we need to create a woman for we need to create a, a help mate a, a somebody to support and encourage and for him to to develop with so let's go do it let's go create the, the woman it's like no 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 no. first we're going to create a whole bunch of animals and they're going to bring all the animals past him one by one and he's going to name them he's going to put labels on them all well how do you label an animal if you've never seen a cat before and you're presented with a cat and god says we'll give it a name you're like thing 322 it's like no you're not I mean, it's, not, it's going to be some binary number you're just going to allocate to the animal you're going to look at the animal and go well what does it sort of remind me of what do i you know what do i feel what do I think? You know, the cat comes up and purrs and rubs itself up against his leg, and meows and looks up and says, feed me. And he's like, oh, he's so cute. The big wide eyes. We've all seen Shrek. We've got the puss in boots. He's like, no, no, no. Everybody's like, oh, it's so nice. Right? Yeah. God says, that, that thing, that thing you're feeling right now, that thing, that's called empathy. That's called a connection. When he brings the dog up, the dog comes bounding up. And licks all his arms and his legs and rolls at his feet and rubs himself and he's like you know that feeling you're feeling that's called joy of joyful because dog's a man's best friend dog is always happy to see you you have the worst day ever and come home and that dog's happy that dog can have the worst day ever and he sees you and that dog's happy and so he he names the animals after characteristics 
and that's what he's being taught is you need to develop an understanding of yourself before you can have any meaningful relationship with somebody as complex as you and you need to own those feelings you need to own those characteristics because they belong to you they are part of you they make you up and so then he creates eve and now he understands eve because eve is him equally as complex has all those same feelings has all those same characteristics they're identified in those animals and so you know we come across we come across in the in the in the story of the clean animals three specific types of animals dogs pigs and camels and they, they come up quite a bit in the bible um you know dogs represent the gentiles christ says is it is it appropriate that i should give unto the dogs that which belongs to the children he uses the word puppies and that's in the context of the canaanite woman right well what's the characteristic of dogs well we're told in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, and second of Peter chapter 2, verse 22, that they go back to the vomit. They throw up and they go back to it. So they are unable to break the cycle of sin in their lives. It's a good representation of Gentiles. They can never come to the truth because they can never overcome sin. It keeps coming up. Um, we have pigs. You know, cast not your pearls before swine. Pigs um, were unclean because they didn't have a stomach. They didn't, have, they didn't chew the cud, they didn't have a stomach. So it represents the believer that appears to walk in the truth, turns up to all the meetings, wears all the right stuff, says all the right things, but they have no raw stomach for the truth. They're unable to bring forth fruit. And camels represent believers that have an appetite for the truth. They subscribe to the principles of God, but they're unable to walk in the truth. They have cloven hooves, they have, sorry, um, they have stomachs, they have. So they chew the card, but they're unable to walk in the truth. And so we need to be careful that we're not an unclean animal. And we need to be careful that we don't allow unclean things into our lives because those things will invariably destroy us and make us unfruitful in the Lord. That's not a good thing. And so we find that something, something a bit different about day six to the other days is this interesting comment he says here um in uh, in verse 25 god made the beast of the field after his kind and the cattle after their kind and everything according that creeps upon the earth after his kind and god saw that it was good now and every other day that was the end of the day we've been on the next day but not so this day right the angels have a debate and a discussion with each other they stop and, and have a chat about what they're going to do next which is interesting because everything else up until this point has been nailed down everything up until this point has been finalized they are working to a plan but now they get to day 20 to, to the end of day six and and there is a discussion this bit hasn't been finalized they say well what are we going to do now We've got all this amazing creation which looks great but something's missing what's missing well we're missing we're missing something we're missing we're missing the crowning glory of the whole thing aren't we and so they say i know what we should do let's create the care of them let us create this unique animal this unique creature and he's going to be unique because he's going to look like us physically and he's going to have the same capacity that we have that's interesting isn't it it's interesting that that this bit hadn't been fully worked out amongst the angels probably been some debate and some discussion and some thinking about it like well we could do this or we could do that but it's not until they've got the last piece in place with the animals that they go you know what we're missing a piece there's a piece missing and we know that because at the end um uh verse 31 god saw that everything he had made and behold it wasn't good it was great it was very good in fact it was wonderful but until that point 
it wasn't wonderful until that point it wasn't very good it was just good now good's good but it ain't very good there's a difference between those two things so what is it then that makes this particular animal this particular creation so different and so unique well first and foremost he doesn't run around on all four legs covered in hair uh, his primary his primary sensory function is not smell his primary sensory function is sight that's interesting that's really interesting because what does it say about the cherubim in Ezekiel chapter 11 it had wings and in the wings were full of eyes that's interesting isn't it fully aware completely aware nothing gets past the cherubim they see and humans do we we, we see substantially better than any other animal whereas animals have way better smell and way better hearing than we do but our, our sensory input is sight what's really important for sight and what's the most important thing for sight light yeah like if you're in a dark room it's pretty hard to smell your way out of it i mean really dark like if you closed your eyes in a dark room you'd have to wander around smelling your way out of it like that would be difficult yeah that's right because you can't see how you're gonna get out of the room you're gonna smell your way out yeah because humans don't have a good smell right now maybe you'd be able to hear your way out if somebody's knocking on the door on the other side and that's sort of which way you go but light is a critical function for humans which is why christ says if the eye be dark in other words seeing you can't see then you are so in the pitch black that there's nothing that can be done for you like if you're if, if you're if your eye is incapable of seeing spiritually then you might as well be like any other animal relying on smell relying on hearing just like a dog or a cat or a mouse and so we're told that adam's physical appearance would be that of the angels and we're told that that is a genetic thing because in genesis chapter 5 verse 3 we're told that seth was in the image of adam and so this is this is a biological genetic um, predisposition and transfer but what's probably more important is this other idea this idea of likeness you know if you've done sunday school or you've read Alpha's israel there's quite a dissertation on likeness the word likeness means mental aptitude or capacity not intellect it's, it's not the ability to do maths or to work out a plan or to be able to define a list of activities or define a series of steps that was what the serpent was really good at the serpent was really good at looking at information and coming up with a thesis right? but that's not what this is this idea of likeness is moral capacity not mental capacity the ability to be spiritually aware the ability to comprehend and understand the laws of god independent of any other information whether that other information is prevailing or not and that was the problem the serpent had because the serpent had a whole bunch of other prevailing information oh, there's no way you're going to die whereas adam and eve had a moral capacity it doesn't matter what it might look like it doesn't matter how good your argument is if it contravenes the laws of god it's wrong and it's wrong because god said not because i have to prove it to you because the serpent wouldn't understand right or wrong right you imagine trying to explain to the serpent <laughs> you can try and explain it to died in the wool atheists wasting your time sadly so so man is different he's really different Solomon picks this idea up in ecclesiastes 3 verse 21 um in ecclesiastes 3 verse 21 he says for there is a man ooh, yeah, two three three twenty one just not two twenty one who knows the spirit of man right so who knows who understands 
the spiritual aspect of man or the driving force of man or the the mental and spiritual aspects of man they go upwards right they ascend they are aspirational they are spiritual and the spirit of the beast which descends to the earth so you've got a big difference between the characteristic the spirit of the man and the spirit of the beast one has a capacity to appreciate the power and the wonder of god and his laws and the other does not have that capacity at all you know, for the vast majority of animals when they're standing their default position is looking at the ground whereas a man their default position is to look to the horizon to look up and far out or upwards and so psalm 8 is a great example of this it's david considering the great creation psalm 8 verse 3 he says when i consider the heavens the work of your fingers the moon the stars which you have ordained what is man that you take any thought of him and the son of man that you spend time with him for you made man a little lower than the angels and yet you have crowned him with glory and honor you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands now why was he given dominion over the works of god's hands remember why what gives you the power to rule we spoke about it at the beginning light gives you the power to rule the ability to understand right and wrong the ability to direct things in the right way and so man is given dominion over the work of god's hands you have put all things under his feet the sheep the oxen the beasts of the field the fowl of the air the fish of the sea whatever passes through the paths of the seas yahweh our lord how excellent is your name in all the earth and so this new creation this this cherubim this creature which has the capacity to transport and carry the spirit of god who has the light and who has eyes to see is the crowning glory of creation you know verse 5 says that he was made a little lower than the angels christ says well it's only for a little while he says in luke 20 verse 35 to 36 that you will be equal to the angels do you not know that the angels in heaven don't marry and give in marriage you'll be the same you are as you are equal to them and paul applies psalm 8 to christ in hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 the lord of creation well of course he's the lord of creation he's the cherubim and so he compares man to these animals that which is in the image and likeness of god which is why god spends time with us which is why god is mindful of us with those things which aren't in god's image and likeness over which the cherubim are given dominion which is why we find in the new testament we read that christ is given all power over all creation and revelation is all about christ exercising that power over the nations that's his he's exercising that power over all of the animals the weird lion cross bear cross leopard cross alligator thing with ten horns and crowns he's given power over that why because it's an animal he has dominion he exercises authority over it of course he would uh, so it's 8.22. Um, we'll finish on we'll finish on this idea. Come across to Philippians chapter 1. So we've been talking, haven't we, about how the creation day one is like a, a, a pyramid. It, it culminates at a pinnacle, and that pinnacle is the cherubim. It's the creation of Adam and Eve. And how 
those days, the principles that are locked up in day one and day four and day three and day five and day, sorry, day three and day six and day two and day four and day one and day three, yeah, get that right, um, are all critical to the creation of the cherubim. So you need to have light, you need to have separation, you need to have productivity, you need to have blessing, right? That's that's all tied up inside the principles of those days. And at the end of it, you've got this creation of the cherubim. So come across to Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. And this is a spiritual creation. So Philippians 1 and verse 5, we read these words. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, so you got that? From the first day. Day one, until now, God is undertaking a work with you. Now, just what is day one? What happens in day one? Just hold your hand there and come back to Second Corinthians chapter 4. And just to see how many, how many aspects of creation we can, we can find here. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we don't faint. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. So we renounce the dark things of dishonesty, not walking in cunning, nor handling the word of God with deception, but by manifesting of the truth, commend ourselves to every one, every man's conscience in the sight of God. So, so what does that sound like? Well, that sounds like day one, doesn't it? It sounds like the darkness and the confusion and the blackness and the earth and the world being covered in water. Dishonest, craftiness, deceitful. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So those who are left in the dark, those who are completely confused and completely empty, without form and void. In whom the God of this world has blinded their mind, the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. What happens on day one? The light shines. What is the light? The light is the word of God. It's the gospel. And who is it the gospel of? The gospel of Christ. And who is he? Well, he's the care of him. He's the image of God. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Christ's sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. That's a direct quote from Genesis chapter 1. God called forth the light, didn't he? He commanded it to shine. God said, let there be light, and there was light. To give the light of the likeness of God, the likeness of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the cherubim. Image and likeness. Gone from darkness, without form and void, covered with water, the light shines forth. That's the first day. And what does it culminate in? Well, it culminates on the sixth day. The cherubim who is both the image and the likeness. Now, the first day, remember? So we were looking at this back in Philippians chapter 1, verse 5. Verse 6. Being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a work in you will perform it until the day of the cherubim. So, brothers and sisters, he's working in you and he's working in me to turn us into cherubim. Now, Adam and Eve sinned and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. They were cast out of fellowship with God, weren't they? Cast out. What kept 
the way to the tree of knowledge, the tree of life. Remember what it was? What was the barrier? What was the cherubim? It was a cherubim and it carried a flaming sword. In other words, it was a living creature. That's something that Ezekiel 11 tells us. It stresses the point. In Ezekiel 1 through to 11, it stresses the point. It's a living creature. It's a living creature. It's a living creature. In other words, it has an independent will. But despite the fact that it's a living creature, it's a vehicle for the spirit of God. And so here is the cherubim, which is the barrier to fellowship with God. right? And he's got the word of God. And what's Adam being told? There's a work going on with you, buddy. And if you want to get to the tree of life, you've got to become one with the cherubim. God will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And that's when we become part of the cherub. So come back then with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. What was the cherubim's job? Cherubim's job was to be a vessel that contained the glory of God. That's what it was, wasn't it? That's what Adam and Eve were designed to do. Verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So we're not just to carry it, we're to manifest it. That light should be seen. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more excellent and eternal weight of glory. And so it's working in us, in these earthen vessels, an eternal weight of glory, an eternal outcome. Man is to fulfill his design brief man is to fulfill his purpose that's you and it's me that's the work god is doing in you and me if we have dominion over the animals inside ourselves if we dominate the unclean things the unclean characteristics inside and promote the clean things inside ourselves and as long as we don't lose sight of the work God is doing with us. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen and distract us, but at the things which we don't see naturally. For the things which are seen are passing away, but the things which are not seen are eternal. They last forever. So how do you see? That's the question. What are you focused on? Are you like the cherubim who had great wings and all these eyes all over the wings and saw everything for what it was? Or are we in the dark? Because we have no light. And so we'll end our class there um and next week we will jump into chapter two um and we'll probably take a summary we'll take a summary approach to chapter two just because it's our last class um and we'll look at the creation of adam um we've already looked at, at the animals but we, we'll, we'll run through that again quickly and then we'll look at the creation of eve um because there's some really interesting additional data and information in that uh in that section so uh any questions i've probably well there we go there's the seas there's the oceans being bound up and, con and contained and there's the fruitful fields the fruitful uh earth and well, there's the camel we don't want to be like him looks like somebody i know yourself <laughs> <laughs> not me
okay any questions